unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Praise God. Now, many times when people come to me, the sick, the beggarly, the struggling with an issue or probably marriage, relationships, business, career, etc., regarding the challenges that people go through, Sometimes, or to a very large extent, I have seen that there are things, there are thoughts, there are, there's a mindset that certain people have about God that hinders the anointing, that hinders the power of God from functioning effectively in their lives. Praise the Lord. Some people, the way they view God, the way they relate with God, the way they respond to the God you and I know, is sort of contradictory to the way God is and the way God thinks. And for such, some of us have, we've prayed, we've fasted, we've given, we've done everything. We've made confessions of faith. But then there are also certain areas that we've not dealt with and for such, we cut short the power of God and the opportunity for him to move on our behalf. Praise God. And I'm going to show you one other way that holds the word of God void of its power. You know, when the Bible says that my people perish for a lack of knowledge, sometimes it's not that knowledge is not present. Sometimes it's that knowledge is present, but it is incomplete. You understand? And if it's not full, it's not helpful. It's like going to a doctor and then they give you a treatment. But then you don't finish the dose. Chances are that you might come back to that doctor again sick. Isn't it? But you're not sick because the, the drug would not heal you, but because you did not follow the regimen. You did not follow the, the instruction of two times three or seven times four. <laughs> Hallelujah. By the way, if you're, you're on drugs, I want to pray for you that God will take you off those drugs. Pr praise God. Romans chapter 8 verses 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God who are called according to his purpose. One more time. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. We don't pray. We don't hope. We don't plead the blood of Jesus for things to work. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Now, let me tell you how religious, deceived people read that. Deceived people read that as, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord, to them who are called according to his purposes, and also depending on what they do or what they don't do. That one stays in the back of their head as a mental note. It's not direct. You don't hear it directly. But it stays in the back of many people. Yes, we know that all things work together for good for them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And then they add on. But also it is subject on what they do and what they don't do. I'm breaking religion right now. Some demons live slowly. They live unannounced. 
Romans 8.28 has nothing to do with what you do except to love him and are called according to his purpose. He says, if you are called according to the purpose of God and you love him, all things work together for good. All things work together for good. Ha, ah, but apostle, we have a problem here. Some people are going through whatever they are going through because they don't love God a certain way. What is loving God, they say? What is loving God? And then some say in John 14, 15, and 16, many misinterpret that scripture. And because of that, many people are dying. They are sickly, they are poor, they are beggarly because they misunderstand that scripture. In John 14, verse 15, he says, if you love me, huh? listen, keep my commandments. Did you hear that? He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Remember Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good for them that love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. Huh? And, and you see, God has said that if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So if you break my commandments, you don't love me. And if you don't love me, all things will not work together for good. So if you love me, then you have to keep all my commandments. Ah, okay. So I've not kept all the commandments of Jesus. Therefore, I don't love him. And because I don't love him, all things are not going to work for good. Certain things are going to work wrong. Some things are going to get warped. Some things are going to get messed up because I don't love him. Why? Because I judge my love for God based on my actions. Again, somebody quoted for me John 14, 15. You understand what I'm saying? There's a problem again. For the man who is saying grace, grace, under grace, okay? Okay, so if I'm under grace, then how does this reconcile? He said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. I agree. All things work together for good for them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And he says that if you love me, you will do or keep my commandments. That means if I don't keep Jesus' commandments, I don't love him. And if I don't love him, then all things cannot work together for good because I don't love him, even if I might be called according to his purpose. You see that? Now there's a problem. So I make a mistake and something happens and I'm like, ah, yeah, you know why this is happening? I broke a commandment of Jesus. And because I broke a commandment of Jesus, I deserve what is happening to me. Why do I deserve what is happening to me? Because I've not kept his commandments. And if I don't keep his commandments, it means I don't love him. So anything that happens to me because I've not kept his commandments, it deserves to hit me because he says all things work together for good. Now, if things are contrary to me, they might be as a result of the things that I've done in the past. So they say. And many of them, they carry guilt, stains, they carry judgment on their lives, they judge themselves, and when they do, they cut themselves off from the life of God. Because, again, religion leaves out the weightier issues. That's the problem Jesus had with religious people. He told them, woe unto you religious people. For you leave out the weightier issues of the law, of faith, and of judgment. What religion does is it does not give you the full revelation of the judgments of God. It does not give you the full revelation of faith toward God. It does not give you the, the full revelation of the law. That's why he says, one well, to you scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites, for you pay tithe of meat and anise and come in and have omitted the weightier matters of the Lord, judgment, mercy, and faith. When you're under religion, you will never have a full understanding of the law because if you understood the law, you'd understand Christ. You will not have a full revelation of the judgments of God. You will not have a full revelation of the mercy of God. And you will not have a full revelation of the spirit of faith. No wonder people who are religious don't do miracles. The only appeal to those that 
relate to philosophies, endless myths and genealogies. The Bible says that minister questions to the hearts of the hearers rather than godly edification, which is after faith. Faith does not bring questions. Why? Because faith comes with answers. Somebody shout hallelujah. And the people now who say, oh, I know why this is happening. Because I didn't obey this. I know why this is happening. Because I didn't obey this. So it's almost as though called according to the purpose of God was the doing of God, but the loving of God is their doing. That's what they're saying, isn't it? Because remember in John 14, 15, it says that if you love me, you would keep my commandments, right? When it comes to purpose, I don't ordain myself. I elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. That means when, when it comes to the election, when it comes to the calling, when it comes to purpose, I have no part. But they're saying, but when it comes to the love of God, I have an application of to do. And because I've not done that love, therefore, if things are working south for me, if things are going contrary to how I think and see, then it might be because I have not kept the commandments of God. So in that equation, it's almost as though the pendulum balances on the thing that God has done according to purpose, but when it comes to the love, then it is my doing. Then again, we've gone back to works. But it is because we have not revealed the weightier issues. And that is why I tell people that truth has degrees. Never forget that. Truth has degrees. And every degree of truth defines the realm of glory in which a man functions. Never forget that. He says, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. He didn't say we'll set you free. We're not in the realm of setting free. We're in the realm of making free. This is response to the law of liberty. Not just the man coming out of bondage. In fact, the church is teaching the gospel so interestingly. You know, when Galatians tells you that it's for freedom that Christ died. When Jesus died, your freedom began at the resurrection. You understand? And then he appeals to you and tells you, stand fast therefore in the liberty where with Christ has what? Set you free. Stand fast therefore in the freedom wherefore or liberty wherewith Christ has made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. When you became born again, you became free. For whoso the Son sets free is free indeed. You began your life from freedom. And God now tells you, make sure you stay free. Today what do they teach us? When you become born again, you become born again with generational curses. Spirits of your mother's mother, cousin's uncle, and the cousin's judge. All of those things have been following you. The moment you get born again, you enter deliverance class. Look at people who have gone through deliverance on the onset of their salvation. Many of them up to today are still struggling. Examine yourself. Because your foundation defines how high you go. Because foundations define depths. And remember the Bible tells us, and by his knowledge, depths are broken. In other words, you dig deeper through knowledge. The more you know through knowledge, is the higher you go through the manifestation of the spirit. Every building goes as high as it has been established in the ground. Somebody shout hallelujah. Who is following what I'm saying? You are free. So when we reveal truth to you, we make you free, but free to do what? He's not talking about the issue of a demon leaving you. That's not the revelation of what truth does in the making of free in that scripture. Making free means that you are given the, the mind and understanding of what it means to live in the freedom and liberties of the New Testament dispensation, both with the knowledge of who called you, that is God, come to him knowing who he is and the reward of them that diligently seek him and the nature that you possess with him. Let me give you an example of bondage. Simple example of bondage. If you go in a restaurant and then you look at 
a menu. And there is food. So 40,000, 30,000, 60,000, 80,000, 90,000. All of this is what? Food. And then for a moment, your brain tells you, ah, this is expensive. <laughs> Some people think that being bound is when they, they rebuke a demon and says, I will not leave her. She's my wife. No, you see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But there's another sort of bondage. Let me tell you why it's bondage. He told you in scripture that even the birds that do not plant, the Bible says they find food. Do you understand what I'm saying? They find food. It tells you do not worry what you shall eat or drink or put on. He says, for I feed the birds. He says, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is it not life more than meat and the body than the raiment? Next verse. He says, behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather in two bands. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they are? So if you're better than a bird, how do you look at a menu and say, ah, 60,000, and you look away? I know what your answer will be. Because I, that dad moved with 30,000. Oh, okay. Why did you have only 30,000? Because that's what I had. Why did you have 30,000? When he shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ. Why did you have 30,000? Why were you not able to eat the meal you wanted when you wanted it? Who is following what I'm trying to say? That is when you learn to practice faith. If you go in an expensive restaurant, every time you go there, push your faith to a more expensive meal. <laughs> Somebody shout hallelujah. Put your faith to a more expensive meal. One time I was in South Africa and I entered a shop and I looked at very nice watches and I asked this guy, how much is this watch? Very candidly, the guy said, $50,000. I said, 5000 He says, no, $50,000. Karamando sheketereba. And guess what the man of faith did? I looked at the pastor next to me and said, Yeah, that's a fair amount. It's not expensive. And the man looked at me like that. So, where are you from? I told him, Uganda, baby, Uganda. <laughs> but some people, the man say, 50,000. You even put it down, they might break it and then they deport them. <laughs> <laughs> That's bondage. Praise God. Praise God. <laughs> Another day I was in a foreign land and I'm a lover of nice cars. So one of those days we went to uh, a bond. But these ones were high-end cars. You know the high-end things? And then I saw a very nice car. And I told the guy, how much is this? So me and the friend were with church members. Well, we got to know the amount was close to about $300,000. It's a little small car, but $300,000. That's what, more than a billion, 1.2 billion or so. Eh? So I looked at the car. Hmm. So I told the guy, so um, if, if we paid, for example, now... <laughs> You see, so if we paid, for example, now, when, when would it take to, to get, for example, to a place like Uganda? Say, so the guy gave me a little mask there. And then, you know, out of curiosity, he's like, oh, what's your, 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 your taxes like? We told him, close to about 100%. Says, oh, so that means you, this was a South African guy, says, so that means you're going to pay like $600,000 to take this care to Uganda? I told him, yeah, pretty much that. That's a lot of money. I told him, brother, money is not our problem. He says, what? <laughs> ah, 
Ah, say, say, say. What did you say? That money, money is not your problem. Yeah, it's not our problem. So we continued moving around. The guy followed us and he said, say, say, seriously, teach me to make money. <laughs> What an opportunity to preach the gospel. For we know the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus, who even though he was rich, but became poor for your sex, that through his poverty you may be rich. You understand? These were two different men, one seeing things from one kingdom, another one seeing things from another. Practice your faith. When you start a conversation like, uh, you know, let's go. My food is cheaper in that restaurant. Ooh. Ooh. Food is cheaper in that restaurant. You need help. Praise God, somebody. Let me tell you something. I've learned about money. When you commend yourself to the conscience of men, eh? And the things of this world. You see, again, it's a wisdom. How many of you know that? You start to attract where you believe you are. Can I tell you one story? One time I was going to preach somewhere. I think I was driving a car. I had my nephew Israel here. I think somebody else in the back. Were three people going for ministry. And then some guy had, he was selling bubble gum on the street. You know how those guys sell bubble gum? And so this guy comes on my window with his bubble gum, eh? Obit. Then he hits my window. Hey, bossy gula, eh? meaning buy. Gula gula, meaning buy. I told him, I'm good. Gula gula. He says, mm -mm, I'm good. Then he said in Luganda, Kale boss can kwe wiku bango la bika sente. Kwata. I told him, are you serious? Alari boss, alari, kwata, kwata, kwata. Ola bika sente mwano, ola bika sente, kwata. Let me translate for you know no English. The guy said, okay, let me give you for free because you look like money. You know what I did? I went in my, my wallet and got some wonderful amount and I sowed in the word prophesied on my life. <laughs> Glory! You look anointed. You look wise. You look rich. You look healthy. You're more than a conqueror by Christ who strengthens you. You look higher than anybody I know. You look wiser. You look like one with understanding. You look like one with the ability. You look like a leader. You look. Some people go for interviews and they look like thieves. The boss says, Baba, this guy looks like a thief. Seriously, look at his eyes. No. Somebody shout hallelujah. Say, I'm a child of the most high. What did he say? The wine is for what? To make the man's heart merry. The oil is to make the man's face shine. And the bread is to strengthen the man's heart. The oil, the anointing, it, 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 there's something it puts on you. Even when you stand before an interviewer, even if you stand before somebody you're going to do a business deal with, you look like you have the ability in the mighty name of Jesus. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves as of to know of anything as of ourselves, but the sufficiencies of God who has made us able ministers of the covenant. You have the oil. Somebody shout hallelujah. Men will favor you above others. They'll look at you and want to work with you without even showing them your resume. Because you have God. Somebody shout hallelujah. Say because I have God. <laughs> do you know there are people who don't look like they have the ability to do? You go for a multi-billion dollar deal and they say, uh-uh. Something inside there tells me she can't manage. But when you have this thing, brother. I said when you have this thing, brother. 
you go and they say, uh-uh. She looks like she has it. Somebody say they're talking about me. Say again and say they are talking about me. The weightier issues. So I say, truth has degrees. And to the degree of truth revealed is to the degree of glory upon your life. Never forget that. Never forget that. Never forget that. It makes you, doesn't set you, it makes you. That means it gives you the liberty to access what is revealed. For the revealed things belong unto us. Somebody shout hallelujah. So in John 14, when he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandment. Some people or some of our believers give the impression that that is the part where you actually have to do. And then the purpose, you don't have anything to do with that. And therefore, they put the love for God in the equation of the things that are done. And because it goes into the things that are done, it now submits itself to the sufficiency ability of the man and qualifier or disqualifier of the man. But I have good news for you. If you see the way it is mind of this revelation, you will realize that it is not so. And I'll prove it. Let's go back to John 14, 15. <laughs> he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Full stop. Who was Jesus talking to? Was he talking to new creation? Were the guys he was talking to born again? And this is where the next line gives us the answer. The next line says, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. And the next verse says, even the spirit of truth. So was he talking to born again believers? He wasn't talking to born again believers. He was talking to men who were not yet born again. And he's telling them, look, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. But you can't love me until the Holy Ghost comes. So I'll pray the Father. Because you must love me. You must love me. You must love me. But you can't love me. You can't love me with your own ability. You can't love me. Love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Who was he talking to? Jesus is telling them this is the law. He's simply reciting the command. He was repeating what was already known. But the mind of the spirit tells you, no man has the ability to love God with all their heart, their mind and soul. No man has the ability in their own self to love God the way God wants you to love him. No man has that ability. So he says, okay, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, but you'll not keep my commandments because you don't have the ability to love. Let me ask God to send you another helper, a comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him for he dwelleth with you and shall, shall, shall future be in you. You understand what I'm saying? He shall be in you. Romans chapter 5 and verses 5. He says, and hope maketh not ashamed because, listen, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is what? Which is what? The word shed abroad, the Greek word for shed abroad is a keho, which is translated, the keho is translated as, the word shed abroad, it means literally given. Metaphorically, it's given, it's put on your spirit, it's, it's distributed on you, it's bestowed on you, it's, it causes you, it is caused on you. You don't, you don't wake up and you have it, no. It is put on you. So when you receive the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost causes you to love God. That means no man has the Holy Spirit and does not love God. <laughs> eh? No man has the Holy Ghost and does not have the love of God. So when we tell you, for example, love God, 
in the New Testament dispensation, we are literally telling you yield to his love. But we are not telling you have it as though you don't have it. No. The Holy Spirit has said that I have bestowed on you. I have put on you love. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you become a lover of God. So that's also not in your docket of doing. Receive the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost will love through you. Somebody shout hallelujah. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verses 5 when he was talking to the children of Israel. Speaking as a typification of the future dispensation of grace you and I live. He said, and the Lord thy God will bring thee in the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. Oh, 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 Listen, by the way, I will do better than any man that has gone before me in the gospel. Because Deuteronomy says it. And I will never be jealous of a man who shall come after me and do better. Because the Bible is clear. I will multiply thee above thy fathers. That's why Fanero has to grow. That's why Fanero must grow. Because we are in the fulfillment of God's promise upon our lives. And the next verse says, listen. And the Lord thy God, listen, will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed, listen, to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all thy soul, that you may live. See, how do you love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind? Simple. God has to circumcise your heart and the heart of your children, you understand what I'm saying, to love him. Here, who is circumcising? Yourself? You just say, trust, circumcise. No. It is God who circumcises you and circumcises your seed. And here he's not circumcising the physical flesh. He's circumcising the heart. How does he do it? By the Holy Ghost. Somebody shout hallelujah. By the Holy Ghost. To love God. Somebody say I'm a lover of God. And it's not in my doing. It's in my faith in him to do. Woo! Somebody shout hallelujah. Romans chapter 2 verses 28. I want, I'm trying to build some. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. That means, here he's talking about, do you know why he's talking about the circumcision of the flesh? Because it is done by human hands. It is done by human effort. This one of the heart has nothing to do with human effort. And that's what the next verse says. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. Listen. And circumcision is that of the heart, comma, in the spirit, comma, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. That means you don't say, oh my goodness, that man loves God. No, rather, oh my goodness, God has caused that man to love him. Because it's not to the praise of man. But why is it that certain people love God more than others? Simple. It is because some people believe in him more than others do. The more you believe in God, the more you love him more. Why? Because you yield to the spirit that bestows on you that love. Who has understood what I just said? Are you following? So the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. We are, that's where the circumcision takes place. That's why it says the love of God is shed abroad, it has been shed in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. That's where it begins. Why? Because God himself enters your heart and circumcises it by the Holy Ghost. He does the wonder through the Holy Spirit. Somebody say, I'm a lover of God. <laughs> that does not mean that you'll not make mistakes. Or that because you made a mistake last week, therefore you don't love God. Because again, the love of God is not in your ability of what you do. The love of God is in the ability of the Holy Spirit that is shed abroad, that sheds abroad that love in your heart. 
because the circumcision is not of men, but of God. It's not in the praise of men. So we are not qualified to love God by our own ability that you say, oh, you know why things are working so well for that man? It is because for him he, love, he loves God. And you know why things are not working for you, sister? It's because you don't love God. Listen, then that comes to the praise of the man who loves and the, the, the damnation of the man who doesn't. Yet God is not talking about the man who doesn't and the man who does because it's not in the ability of him who does, neither in the inability of him who doesn't, but it's in the ability of the spirit that causes men to love God. Who has understood what I just said? You're a lover of God. And you don't love God because you did right yesterday. You don't love God because you did right last week. Let me tell you. If you were born again and born of the Holy Spirit, you'll bear me this witness. Every time you've made a mistake, however bad it has been, in there when you check yourself, you know you love him. And there are people who start judging you and say, ah, if you love him, why did you do this? And you might not even know how to explain to them that dude, even though I did this nonsense, in there, I love him. Now I've given you the reason and answer because your love is not based on what you do or don't. Your love is based on the spirit you received that bestows on you that love. So you cannot disqualify yourself based on what you did. To say that because I did this, therefore I don't love God. Let me tell you. Some, when we start preaching grace, some people think, ah, we're telling people to sin. No, we're not. Because you don't need grace to tell a man to sin. Eh? But you see, <laughs> look at David. Look at David, a man after God's own heart. David killed Uriah and took his wife, Bathsheba. He killed a man and took his wife. That was an abomination before God and he was judged and his son died. You all know the story. But in spite of David's problem, God still called him a man after my own heart. The Bible doesn't say that the day he killed Uriah, God took that title and calling of him. He stayed a man after God's heart. You know why I'm saying that? It is because there are people who have made mistakes that if they look at your list, <laughs> uh, uh, Jesus Christ. If some of you, they were to just get the list of things you have done, we will conclude that you hate God because we put the love for God on human effort and ability that is a man circumcising himself and that is the circumcision of the flesh it carries no bearing or variation of the New Testament understanding of circumcision, which is of the heart, and it is the doing of the Lord, and it is shed abroad in our hearts, bestowed on us lavishly by the Holy Ghost. What I'm trying to say is, when you're a new creature, there is nothing you do or don't do that defines your love for God. It is your faith in Him that defines your love for Him. Because when you believe in Him, you receive the Spirit. And when you receive the Spirit, the Spirit causes you to love Him. So when you go for an overnight and pray the whole night, you don't come back saying, you see me, I love God so much. I even pray the whole night. No. The only difference between you and the brother who is not seeking God is simple. You have taken advantage of the grace of God given you. The other one has received it in vain. We all have the ability to love God because the ability is not in our human ability or sufficiency. It's in the ability of the Holy Spirit and every believer has a Holy Ghost. That means you have the ability to seek God. You have the ability to tarry in love. You have the ability to serve in love. You have the ability to forgive. I'm, here, I'm struggling with unforgiveness. Listen. You have not yet understood who you are. That's why you're struggling with unforgiveness. 
It's not because they hurt you so much. No, you have not yet understood who you are and what God has done for you. When you understand that revelation, you realize it's not the application and decision for you too. It's the thing that works in you inherently by its power because you've gotten the revelation of what God has done for you and who you are. That's why one group of guys sang a song and they said, Ivan shall leave as one who's been forgiven. I'll walk with joy to know my debts I'll pay. That's a knowledge. I know my name is clear before my father I am his child and I am not afraid so greatly My brother, did you understand that? The Lord of love, I gladly will obey. You obey the law of love, you find yourself forgiving the worst sin possible in Scripture. Why? Because you know you're a child of God, you've been greatly forgiven, you've been so loved. Your name is clear before the Father. You look at how much he has forgiven you. You look at the list of things you have done and it just all control deleted. He didn't just delete, it would go in the recycle bin. Sometimes you can recover or restore from recycle bin. No, but the old control deleted. It's not even in the recycle bin. If you look for it, it was never there. That's why Psalm 103 says he has not dealt with us as he should. He has not dealt with us as he should. Don't deal with men as they deserve. Don't. They deserve to die. It's okay. Let God kill them. Vengeance is of the Lord. Gladly forgive. Smile even in forgiving. Because you know who you are. If the love of God is not yet working in you, it's not that the Holy Spirit has not bestowed it in you. That it's in there. You know, I've received messages from people Apostle, you know what? I have a problem. I don't love. And I ask them, are you born again? I say, yes, I am. I say, how can you not love? I just don't feel like I love people. You, you, we are in the feeling realm. Get from the feeling realm and get in the knowledge realm. The love of God has been shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost. You love them. Okay, but I don't feel it. You don't need to feel it. I don't need to feel it, but I love you. You might even look so fun, I don't want to sit, but I love you. Because it's not in the realm of feeling. It's in the realm of knowledge of truth. That the Holy Ghost on me, that is why I love even the worst man in this world. Because I have the Holy Ghost. And I love God. Because I have the Holy Ghost. Therefore, my love for him is not based on my performance. And nothing that I do defines whether I love him or not. But everything he does in me defines his love for him by me through the Holy Ghost. Hey, did you understand what I just said? It's not in your power to do. It's not in your power to do. It's in the love of God. It's in the experience of the Holy Spirit that you received. Somebody say, I'm a lover of God. Now you remember that thing that is a jealous God who punishes to the third and fourth generation of them that hate him. What is the possibility of a Christian hating him? Zero. If you're a believer, you can't hate him. Therefore, he cannot revisit the generation of your fourth and third, fourth generation cursing them. Whoa, way. Whoa, way. He says, for I'm a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and to the third and fourth generation of them that 
to hate me, but you don't. Why? Because you have the Holy Ghost. Therefore, you can't have the demon of your father. You can't have the generational curse of your uncle. You can't struggle with the things of your family's generation. Why? Because you love him. How do I know that you love him? You have the Holy Ghost. When I find a man saying, Brakashukotala, I know this man is a lover of God. But you see, he does contrary. Yes, he might do contrary. That's the flesh. I'm talking about the spirit. We regard no man after the flesh, but every man after the spirit. Even the Christ we could regard in the flesh, he's gone. What am I trying to tell you? Don't judge people's love for God by their actions. Because there are people who even do love for God. They're calculating a certain math. You find her rending chairs. You think she's loving God. What? She's calculating Joshua. Joshua marries, she looks for another church. <laughs> that is outward circumcision. And you know, Christians, we are guilty for judging men in the flesh to define their love for God in the spirit. One time, I was praying for a dear believer who had struggled so much with the world. And the church sort of started to judge this believer. Everywhere I used to go, I used to hear people judge this believer. Everywhere I used to go. I sat in conversations of Christians judging the same believer many times. Many, many times. They always judged this believer. They always judged this believer and judged him and judged him. Oh, he was a born-again Christian. Look at what he's doing. Look at this Christian. Look at what he's doing. If he's a Christian, why is he doing this? Ah, la, 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 la. Ah, la, 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 la. And, and for some reason, oh, every time they would do that, I never found myself speaking. And one day, I was in my room, and the Lord brings a vision of this person that I didn't even have a relationship with or even friendship. We're not even acquaintances. The Lord says, how many times have you sat in conversations and they're judging this person? I said many. And I had not judged the person. And the Lord told me, that believer loves me. But people judge that believer by what they see. Not by me or my testimony or what Christ did for that person. You know what? From that day, I started to pray for the person they always judged. I just found myself praying for them. Because I separated what they have done in the flesh and what they are judged for and what they really felt for God because they had the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you, there are many people we judge out there yet they love God way more than many of us. In other words, they have yielded to the work of the Spirit of God and know the difference between their inability and the ability of God on their lives versus some of you who every time works come through and you do good, you forget so much the working of the Holy Spirit and grace and then you put a tag of honor on your ability and strength and wisdom. That is why heaven will shock many. He said publicans will enter before these many people who look like they're holy and righteous. Why? Because many times, every time you start to walk right with God, you tend to forget that he is working in you both to will and to do. You always go in the strength of your ability. That is why in church we are judging other believers. Simple. Every time you judge another man or a woman, you're simply saying you're better than them in your ability. Listen, we are all in the same boat. Even if you have never lied and cheated, we are all for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely through the redemption that is in Christ. All have sinned. All have sinned. Oh, eh, but me, I'm not like that guy. Whoa, Bambi. Newsflash. All 
all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 11 chapter 6. Give me the amplified of that. Romans 11 verse 6. Give me the amplified Bible of that. He says, if it is by grace, his unmerited favor and graciousness, it is no longer conditioned on works or anything men have done. Oh, let me read again. If it is by grace, his unmerited favor and graciousness, it is no longer conditioned on works or anything men have done. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. It would be meaningless. And verse 7 says, What then shall we conclude? Israel failed to obtain what is sought, what it sought, that is God's favor by obedience to the law. Israel position says, let me obey everything, says that I gain favor. And the Bible says God failed to favor them. They look like the people who you see in the church who do everything right, but they don't have favor on their lives. It does not mean that what they're doing is wrong or that now it gives you the license to, to do stupid things because for you are favored in spite of your stupidness. No. He continues to say, only the elect, those chosen few, obtained it while the rest of them became callous and differently blind. Give it to me in the message version of verse 7. He says, and then what happened? Well, when Israel, listen, tried to be right with God on her own, pursuing her own self-interest, she didn't succeed. The chosen ones of God were those who let God, listen, pursue his interest in them, and as a result received his stamp of legitimacy. They are legitimate, they are right, not because of what they've done, not because of their self, own self-interest and their own pursuits to be right with God, but they are legitimate because they let God pursue his interest in them. So God is not saying that it's wrong to, li to live right. He's saying it's right to live right. I said if grace does not lead to purity, holiness, goodness, then it's not grace. It is something else. If when you receive grace, you become more funny, you've not understood grace. But deeper than that, however, also, there are people who are living right, yet so wrong in the face of God. Because it's their own self-interest and their own ability in God instead of simply letting God pursue his interest in them. What am I trying to tell you? When the Bible says that all things work together for good for them that love the Lord and are called according to his purposes, that scripture has nothing to do with what you did or didn't do. It has everything to do with the working of the Holy Spirit and the person of God through faith. What am I trying to say? There are people here who feel that they deserve certain punishments because they messed up long ago. You understand? I can't be healed of this disease because I made a mistake four years ago. That's why I got this disease. Hey, what about the kid who is born with it? What did that kid do? Hello? Satan also tells you it's not about what you do. Otherwise, the kid would not be afflicted by the same disease. You understand? But you see, there are many things that you might not be responsible for and are happening. And there also might be things that are a result of your own doing. And some of you have disqualified yourself. You know, I deserve to be poor because I did this. I deserve to be sick because I did this. I deserve my marriage to fail because I did this. I deserve, listen, do you love him? Do you love him? Are you called according to his purpose? Oh, things work together for good. What I'm trying to say is never disqualify yourself where God has qualified you because it would only mean that you qualify yourself in your ability and disqualify yourself in your inability. Yet, it's not your ability or inability but it is His ability in you. Every time you yield to his ability, you realize that many things will leave. That's what they call repentance, metanoia, to change your mind from a certain world and then go to another. So if you've repented, why aren't you delivered of that thing? Some of you still carry guilt, guilt stains. That's why they sing the song. Lose all the guilty stains. And lose all the 
their guilty stay. How do they lose it? And sinners plunged beneath the flood, lose all the guilty state. Some raise your voice. Lose all the guilty state. Lose all. The guilty state and sinners plunged beneath the flood, lose all the guilty state. The man said, Ever since by faith. I saw that stream, thy flowing wounds supply, redeeming love has been my theme, and shall be Until I die And shall be Until I die Redeeming love Has been my thing And shall be preaching it shall be until I die surely my Lord will go redeeming love redeeming love shall be my theme and shall that as long as I'm still preaching on this altar, I will preach the redeeming love of God. I was not called to change people. Every Thursday I'll give you Jesus. He will change you. He will change you. It's redeeming love. Somebody shout hallelujah. It is what? Redeeming love. He will change you. Before you know that, you'll find yourself walking out of things you never thought you could walk out of. You'll find yourself not struggling with stuff. Why? Because every time love comes, Corinthians 13, it never fails. Love never fails. Love never fails. It never fails to change a man. Don't put yourselves as people who are in charge of changing people. Let God change men for himself. Simply give them Jesus. I've seen one thing for sure. That every time we give men the love of God, the repentance comes automatically. Because love works in them. It is God pursuing his interest in them. All things are working together for your good. Yes, I know you made mistakes. Even there. If love is not in your ability, neither purpose. All things are working together for good. You will finish well. In the mighty name of Jesus. Take a minute and speak in tongues and just receive this word. Mm 
Rosa Lamando Sheke Bracas Telebroco Shalalalalaba. Somebody receive that word. You deserve to be healed. For he has not dealt with you as you deserve. The Bible says, For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy and loving kindness. The Bible says, as a father loves and pities his children, so the Lord loves and pities those who fear him and love him. God understands. You know it's wrong. You're forgiven. Repent. Move away from it. Don't carry any guilty stain. And don't think you deserve the worst because you made a mistake. God has an interest in you bigger than your inability. And that is why he sent Jesus. The Bible says, For we have been called unto glory, yet he knew our weaknesses. Receive that word and know that you deserve all the best things in the world because it's not in your might, your ability, or your history. Paul says one thing that I do is that I set my mind on the things ahead. Not that I've attained, but I seek that I may apprehend that which Christ apprehended me for. And one thing that I do is to forget the things that are past and put my eyes on things ahead of me focusing and uplifting my spirit to the price of the high calling which I'm called in Christ. Forget the past and look in the future. Your future is bright. Somebody shout hallelujah. Give the Lord a mighty hand clap of praise. Thank you Lord. So you're healed in Jesus name. So you're restored in Jesus name. So you're strengthened in Jesus name. So you are uplifted and upheld in Jesus' name. Somebody shout hallelujah. If you're here and you've never given your life to Christ, I want to give you an opportunity to come and welcome this redeeming love. People in the overflow, ask your neighbor, convince them and make sure we win a soul today. Tell them, go in front and receive Jesus. If you're here and you want to receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, Come and receive him tonight. We repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, say today. Say today, I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. I believe that you died for my sins and you were raised for my redemption. You loved me that you died for me. And now tonight, I yield to your purpose in my life tonight I am born again I receive you till the end of my life you abide God Amen The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International For more information contact us on telephone number 041 466 4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero, make manifest.